Imran Khan at home in Lahore only a few weeks ago at his nephew's birthday party. Despite his retirement from world-class cricket, he remains a superstar. Imran has challenged the complacency of Pakistan's ruling elite, and despite his aloofness from official politics, has become an important player in the country's political life. Marriage at this stage was an abstraction, or so it would have seemed. For ten years people have been asking me in Pakistan to get married, and such an obsession with it. So, yes, I said, look, after the hospital is completed, I will get married. Uh, obviously, I would like to marry a Muslim. And what nationality, race, color, for me doesn't matter, because in Islam there is no such thing as uh, race or nationalism or... You know, these are just imposed by culture on us, but Islam gives us freedom. I mean, I could, as a Muslim, marry a Christian or a Jew either, but I would much rather marry someone of my faith only because I think you have a much greater chance of making it a success if two people's values, ideas, ideology are the same and you're going in the same direction in life and you're growing at the same pace. Then Imran astounded everyone by marrying Jemima, the daughter of billionaire James Goldsmith. Press reaction in Britain was frenzied. Had the born-again Muslim abandoned his principles? It would have been much easier for me to marry a Pakistani girl. But uh, life doesn't go as we plan. Uh, the, the plan that prevails is of the Almighty. And so here I am, marrying a girl who is from a completely different background, but shares my vision. Much more she shares my... Uh, uh, my vision, my aspirations, uh, my values, uh, and so that's why I'm married to her. In Lahore, he is the man who promised to build a cancer hospital and delivered. Ordinary people greeted the news of his marriage with relative calm. Pakistan is a country desperately in search of a hero. Alienated from its politicians, the people are expecting a great deal from Imran Khan. Where others have failed, can he turn the desert into water? I feel that things have got so bad that it's going to bring a reaction in this country. People themselves must want to change. They've been too complacent and too long. They've accepted every sort of uh, injustice imposed upon them by unrepresentative governments. You know, they've accepted everything lying down. And I think the people must want to change in this country, and that is the only hope. And if the people want change and, pe and the governments that come in represent the people, I think then this country will become very dynamic. Because, you know, 120 million people is a huge population. And if someone can mobilize these people in a positive way, we have everything here. It's just that it's so badly managed at the moment. Benazir Bhutto returned to Lahore from her London exile in 1986 and took on the generals. The size and scale of her welcome shook the military regime. Expectations ran very high. The stability of Pakistan is important for the stability of the region 
and for global stability because today Pakistan is the frontline state in the fight against narcoti narcotics, in the fight against terrorism, in the fight against extremism. Pakistan is also a voice of moderation in the entire Muslim world. It's an example of democratic change as opposed to revolutionary change within the Muslim world. And I think Pakistan ought to be respected for what it represents in the Muslim world and in this region. A few hundred miles from the capital, Islamabad, lies the Valley of Swat. In the past, its inhabitants have been the most docile in the country. In October 1994, militant Muslims, led by an Islamic fundamentalist political party and supported by the Afghan Mujahideen, who had settled in the area, launched an armed insurrection. Their aim was to impose a rigid Islamic regime. The main town, Saidu Sharif, was the scene of fierce fighting before the rebellion was ended. Peace has now been restored, but tensions remain high. The reason was that the people there wanted Islamic law. And as a result, when the government tried to put down the rebellion, there were a lot of people killed. We don't know how many people died on the side of this movement, but there were at least 11 soldiers killed and there was an, a member of parliament killed. A fair amount of bloodshed. I was in France and I got this news that Swat City has been taken over, its airport has been taken over, and its uh, police stations have been taken over. Its parliamentarian elected representative belonging to our party has been killed. Of course, I ordered that the paramilitary forces uh, should go in, and it was quelled. But when I came back, I put a simple question to our people. I said, where did they come from? And I found out that they were mostly Afghans, and they had come from the so-called religious schools. They were all veterans of the Afghan war, and they had sworn up to take Swat, thinking that with it the government will go, so what they're doing is not really Islamic at all. But Islam for them is not a religion in which you submit before the will of Allah. Islam for them has become a weapon in the political struggle for power. It's a power struggle. At religious schools in Swat and elsewhere, Children are taught to recite the Holy Quran in Arabic, a language none of them understands. For the poor, sending a son to such a school carries a double bonus. The family does not have to feed or clothe him, and they believe they're blessed by God for giving up their son to spread the teachings of the Holy Prophet. Molana Fazl Haq, a leader of the religious insurrection, is quite open regarding his aims. میرے خیال میں بلکہ ہمارے یہ مطالب ہے اگر اس مرکل میں کامل نظام اسلام آیا جو ابھی آئے اس پر ہم مطمئن نہیں ہیں مکمل شریعت اول سے آخر تک مکمل آ جائے انشاءاللہ خود لوگ خود مجبور ہو کر حکمت سے مانگے گے نفع شریعت اور لوگ حکمت بھی مجبور ہو کر دل ان کا خواہ یا چاہیا نہ چاہیا اسلامی نظام لائے I have no doubt that Benazir Bhutto came to power with all good intentions. I felt that uh, she wanted to do good in this country. But I think the way she's gone about surrounding herself with people who are incompetent, and I doubt their integrity very much. And as a result, I think that uh, she has had to rely on rhetoric. She hasn't achieved much. In fact, Pakistan is rapidly going downhill. And I don't think that with the team she's got, whether she's capable of uh, correcting the situation. The law courts in Swat are in a state of total confusion. Until now, the judicial system has been based on the legacy of the British colonial administration with a veneer of Pakistani amendments. In the tribal area, people see justice and cheap justice. Surely, Pakistan must decide what sort of law to follow. They must clarify what are the best things to take from the British justice 
and at the same time, how do they want to impose the Sharia law? As a temporary measure, Qazis, or Islamic judges, have been appointed, but the two systems of law together make for very slow progress. Surely it has to be Islamic scholars who sit down with judges and they come up to some sort of an understanding. Pakistan must decide what sort of law to follow. Justice is for sale in this country. Poor man does not have access to it. So he is going to find the obvious expression in Islam. The debate is not new. During General Zia's dictatorship, Islamic law led to Islamic sentences. Muslim divines debated the merits of individual punishments. Should the fingers of a thief be cut off? Or should it be his whole hand? Mullahs lined up to demonstrate how a hand without fingers could still steal food. There was no debate about when and how a felon should be hanged or flogged. People have seen the inability of successive governments since 1988 to deliver either in terms of uh, a better standard of living or social services or all the other indicators uh, which normally go into an assessment of the quality of life. And I think there is a growing frustration and a growing disillusionment with the ability, and I think this is the most important part, with the ability of the ruling elite, whether on this side or that side of the political divide, to really deliver what uh, would be solutions to the people's problems. I think that if proper Islam is taught, it will cause a revolution against this power elite, which has been like a leech on this country ever since it gained independence. I was not equipped with enough Islamic knowledge to fight the, the Muslim stereotype in the minds of the Western people, like women are slaves in Islam, and you know, the concept of terrorism, that Muslims were terrorists, and they were ignorant and backward, and to be progressive, the Muslim had to be Western. And you know, so I, I found that unless and until I knew enough about Islam, I could not answer my critics or critics of Islam. So th then started the study of Islam, which hasn't stopped, and which probably was the greatest uh, enlightenment for me. My interest in Islam was very gradual. You can't say it was suddenly something happened and I snapped. It was a gradual change which was over a period of time and series of factors helped in that change. At the same time made me aware more and more of my culture. Ever since I can remember praying with my father on Eid days, it was always in Badshai Mosque. My father always used to take me there and I remember huge crowds, fascinated by so many people. It was my earliest memories of praying. My awareness of Islam was always there because my mother was very strongly Islamic. My father was a believing Muslim, practicing Muslim. So it wasn't as if at home there wasn't that influence. My conditioning by the society was different because the school and then in England, at university, all these influences reacted against Islam. And all of them pointed to one thing that Islam, like my culture, was backward. To be progressive, you had to leave these behind. And so it was just an Islamic identity I had. And I actually never understood the philosophy of Islam. For me, Islam was an identity and it was something to pay lip service to but one didn't believe in it.
is a very clear difference between fundamentalism and fanaticism. I feel that I should be proud to be a fundamentalist. After all, the fundamentals of Islam, all they mean is that you, by being accountable to God, you become a better human being. But I assume the way they are portraying me is a fanatic. And I feel that that is a misconception in the West, that anyone who prays is a fanatic. As long as you do not behave like a Muslim, are only Muslim in name, you're a moderate. The moment you sort of pray and fast, you become a fundamentalist. I mean, I assume that's what it means, because no one knows what my views are. Because Imran had begun to take on a public role, inevitably his life is now open to scrutiny. So the controversy over the marriage is related to the stance that he had been taking recently, whereby he was promoting a, um, an attitude which sought to identify more and more with our own religion, our culture, our, even our dress, our sense of identity, and not to uh, be aping the West and trying to become what he called brown salves. Now, in the light of those assertions of his, people are going to measure his decision to marry Jemima against the stance that he had been taking in, in the country. Having called me a fundamentalist or a fanatic, no, I mean, a fundamentalist or fanatic is not expected to marry a Western girl. So, then they started calling me a hypocrite, but it's an image that they portrayed of me. I mean, and then the other, of course, is uh, they kept my imminent entry into politics has been going on for five months. And suddenly, is someone who's going into politics, how is he going to take a step which, is, which was perceived to be unpopular in Pakistan? So, therefore, after having, insisting that I was coming into politics and that I was a fundamentalist, then suddenly when this marriage took place, this called me a hypocrite. <laughs> what was that? Pakistan has always been a land of two religions, Islam and cricket. I believe Allah gives us potential and then he leaves it to us how much hard work we are prepared to put in to achieve that potential and I feel that uh, he gave me the potential in cricket and perhaps if I had gone into other sports I would still have that potential but it was up to me uh, to achieve that potential through hard work and dedication That's up, up in the air, he's getting under it, this could be victory, it is! Pakistan win the World Cup a magnificent performance in front of 87,000 people. Imran Khan has read his side to victory. What a great victory. Imran Khan, his fifth World Cup, his fifth attempt to win the trophy, and he's finally done it. And even the great Imran allows himself a smile there. Imran and your team, I offer congratulations on behalf of the world of cricket. And I'd like you to come up here and I present you with the Benson Hedges Prize. Benson Hedges Prize of $50,000. And one more thing. And here, this magnificent Waterford Crystal Trophy. You mustn't drop it. I would just like to say I want to give my commiserations to the English team but I want them to know that by winning this World Cup personally it means that one of the, my greatest obsessions in life which is to build a cancer hospital I'm sure that this World Cup will go a long way towards completion of this obsession that speech was uh, embarrassing. The hospital was so much on my mind. I mean, it was the only thing that mattered to me at that stage because I, I realized that had we not won the World Cup, it would have been impossible to uh, build the hospital. I needed that win and I was only playing for the hospital. 
So the release of those emotions uh, was so overwhelming that for once, uh, you know, I just didn't know what to say. And it was just something, muddled opinions that came through. Let's go from down here. Hope you're now enjoying the fire. Imran's dedication of Pakistan's cricketing triumph to his hospital appeal was resented by the rest of the team. Some mistakenly believed that their prize money would be diverted to the hospital instead. The last two years of my cricketing career were for the hospital. So I felt that now, you know, our aims were different. The team wanted money and I wanted the hospital, so I moved in a different direction. The largest government medical centre in Lahore, Mayo Hospital. Long on queues, short on facilities and treatment. My mother was in her last stages of cancer and I was running around various hospitals in Lahore trying to just get her painkillers because we knew she was dying. It was just a question of letting her go in comfort. And it's then that I became aware that in Pakistan we don't even have basic cancer painkillers. Forget about cancer treatment. Doctors didn't know anything how to take care of someone who's terminally ill. And I became aware for the first time in my life what a poor person goes through. If I with influence and money could not help my mother, what happens to the poor man? And that is the basis of the hospital. It was the idea that I wanted to set up an institution for the poor people. Because the rich people can go outside Pakistan for treatment, as I did take my mother out for treatment. But it's the poor man who, uh, you know, who has no help. The whole family is destroyed. They end up selling things. They run around from pillar to post. And not only does the patient die, but the family along with it is ruined by the end of the person's death. <laughs> A few miles from the city centre stands the hospital, named Shokat Khanum, in memory of Imran's mother. In cricket, I felt when I look back at my career, I was a successful player, and especially as a captain, I was successful. And I felt that the difference between me and other players was that I never ever entered a match thinking about losing, thinking about failure. I mean, no matter how tough the opposition, I always imagined winning. And I think it's the same principle that was applied to the hospital. But you know, it was this uh, optimism I had, and it, it, this is born from idealism, which is born from faith. Mm. What makes this particular hospital different from others such as Mayo is that here, so they claim, the poor are able to be treated completely free of charge on a first-come, first-served basis. This has not happened in Pakistan before. Even though building work is still in progress, many departments have opened so that patients are already admitted for diagnosis and treatment. The latest scanning equipment is imported from the United States and Europe. The intention is that once these facilities become operational, the revenue they generate will help to subsidize those patients who cannot afford treatment. So the patient and the uh, ray comes from here? Comes out from okay. here, yeah. Radiation. And this is of course the walls are quite thick, seven feet thick, I'm told. It's uh, to prevent, huh? At least, at least. At least. To prevent radiation leakage. And we'll what is the, I mean, more. the average uh, uh, duration for it, for a treatment for a single dose? Mm. Uh, normally five minutes, six minutes. It well, depends on the fields, how many fields we are giving yeah. to the patient. That's right. How much it cost? 
depending on what options you have on the machine, can cost from one to two million dollars. That's pretty good. ਸੁਨਿਆ <laughs> Initially, the government of Punjab gave us the 20 acres of land, which was very useful. And then when Nawaz Sharif was the Prime Minister, he gave us uh, an initial grant of $250,000. After that, somehow the, uh, the assistant dwindled, and we actually had problems even in getting administrative things done by various governments. But the current government, the People's Party's government, instead of helping us, it actually put uh, obstacles in the way. And in fact, uh, the last few months have been very tough. And in order to get these funds, we have to get on television. It was basically a commercial to show the hospital to show the facilities we had brought in, that they were latest, that what it was supposed to do was to treat the poor patients, and what the people had given, where the money went. In Islam, we have a very good concept of zakat. It's a compulsory Islamic tax to give to the poor people two and a half percent of your wealth. Habib Bank, United Bank, Muslim Commercial Bank, National Bank, Allied Bank, First Women Bank, if we don't go on television and show the hospital, there's no way we can collect any money from the public. And of course the government has banned me coming on television or the hospital or anything to do with cancer. Anything we do, even an awareness campaign has been banned on television. Could the Ministry of Information really have perceived that a cancer hospital built by a cricketing hero might be a political threat? Could they really have been so foolish? The Prime Minister denies this charge. I've got a letter from him praising me for the assistance that we have given the hospital. And not only my government, but even previous governments have donated money and land. So everybody has been very supportive of the hospital because it was meant for the treatment of cancer. And our government is supportive of all such initiatives in the private sector. I don't know how much Benazir Bhutto knows about this project. I don't know what she's been fed by her sycophants. But there is no doubt that her government is responsible for a lot of damage to her hospital. Ajaz sahab, aapka bhoat bhoat shukriya. Main sab se pehle to aap sab ko bhoat khusham de deta hoon yaha ane ki aur aapko jo bhi bachon ka ilaj ho raha hai. Mujhe ye khushi hai ki ये हॉस्पिटल खुल गया और आपको मौका मिला अपना बच्चों का सही तरह इलाज करवाने का क्योंकि आपकी दुआओं की बहुत जरूरत है बहुत-बहुत शुक्रिया आपका अ पार्टी टू सेलिब्रेट द मुस्लिम फेस्टिवल ऑफ ईद मोस्ट ऑफ दीस चिल्ड्रन हैड बीन टोल्ड दैट देयर वाज नो क्योर सम इवन हैड बीन लेफ्ट टू डाई नूरम तरीके को दुनिया के दर की खरत और दिखा दे इंशाल्लाह ये लो बच्चे ये लो नुसरत नुसरत अच्छा मैं जी तहसील दिपालपुर अपने जिस बे से इस स्टेज पर आया मैं किसी ने नहीं कहा डॉक्टर इत मैं उन्हें गिला तो नहीं करना चाहता लेकिन मानू भी ये सोचना चाहिए मैं कह लगे कि सुरंज नहीं हैगी 
इस म्यू अस्पताल की आज से पंद्रह साल के साथ पहले दी बात है इस जगह पर मैं आया हूँ डॉक्टर जी से मथे लगती है तो साढ़ी आधी बीमारी कटी जाती ऐसा खुश खुलक जो डॉक्टर हैं वो खान साहब से ज्यादा वादू हैं खुश खुलकी में नहीं दुश्मनी जा मिलती है भाई मान मैं कहता हूँ कहीं आधा जिस तरह कोई फरिश्ता नहीं होता हंसते ही आंदे वो डॉक्टर मैंने अगे भी और इनकी उम्र बराज करे और इनको कामयाबी अता करे Despite problems in fundraising and during the construction process, the hospital is almost fully operational. Imran's reputation as someone who delivers his promises is firmly established in the public's awareness. It's really at the tail end of my cricketing career that I started studying. The subject which at the moment has set my mind on fire is of course Islam. one of the names of god is al haq the truth when you stand up for truth anyone who opposes you actually opposes god because god is truth in the end of december 1994 imran set off on an arduous money raising tour on behalf of the hospital in 45 days his team visited dozens of cities throughout pakistan We saw some amazing scenes during a fundraising campaign. There was a right to put money in the box. When women came, the whole crowd would part and then everyone would give them an ovation. And then children, children who were very poor who would be begging money normally in the streets, when people at times threw money from the windows, these children would dive to collect this money and triumphantly that bring that 5 rupee note and put it in the box themselves. Uh, but it was very tough because you know we used to sleep out 5 6 hours in the forest but very tough because it was go from morning to evening non stop and traveling as well hat pe ye tere pure karenge vaade tere pure karenge hat pe ye tere pure karenge vaade tere pure karenge i didn't expect it to go as it did and it was because of this uh, that politicians got a little scared actually the greatest reaction was amongst the students i mean especially the girl colleges they were incredible the way they reacted they collected the greatest amount of money in the institutions the girl colleges the tour organized by student supporters culminated in a concert with performances from celebrities at the Fortress Stadium in Lahore These were incredible scenes for us I mean I was so deeply touched by this and yet during the fundraising people's wallets would be stolen but never was one rupee lost which was given to the hospital Everyone thought I was about to make a big announcement. It almost was as if I was supposed to uh you know, announce my political agenda that day. The head of Pasman, Muhammad Ali Durani, he helped us organize the uh, the actual fund collection, the security because we didn't want the police. because people get upset when they see police around us so he helped us with the security controlling the crowds which we i mean how could our office have any experience with that so you know i am more than thankful to him the student supporters largely belong to pasban a youth group which split from its parent organization the fundamentalist political party jamati islami its leader mohammed ali durani now prefers to work outside party politics we are the trend setters and irrespective of party affiliations in pakistan parties are not not getting people together rather they are dividing them into the groups they are trying to make them fight with one another on other hand we are trying to to make people to get people together on the self help basis on the very grassroots level and through this process we we see a, a bigger change 
This simple-minded optimism, which fuels Imran's own politics, is challenged by the Women's Action Forum in Lahore. He's a front man. Well, I think the fact also that he is riding on the shoulders of the Pasban, which is very clearly identified uh, with the Jamaat Islami, which is the one uh, religious party, uh, which I think has damaged uh, the women's cause and uh, the women's movement. And I think for them also this is an opportunity where they are propping up Imran and he's using that philosophy of being humanitarian, of having opened a hospital. And yet at the same time, because he's a hero, I would agree that it is a very dangerous trend. A lot of our friends in school, they think he's a very good person, but they don't like, seem to understand that there are like, other statements he's making about women's rights and stuff and like, should stay at home, married women stay at home. It is going to be a very big threat if it comes to power. What is in fact sinister is that he's coming as this type of populist right. as opposed to the, uh, the military which came uh, with its military garb with an illegal system, an anti-constitutional system. And he is hoping that, I mean, that it will come through a populist way. And I am again agreeing uh, with you uh, that it's actually the forces behind him that is the more dangerous thing. Now we've got this, you know, facade of a dem democratic state. He comes in through popularly elected, you know, um, through the vote and whatever, and it's just very difficult to fight it. Despite him saying that I have now seen the light, I'm a Sufi, I now uh, don't um, uh, um, think of myself only, I think of the public good, I think of everybody. We all remember a few years ago how when he won the World Cup, in yeah. fact, he said, I have won I it. Have won. Yes. He Not also, a word about the TV. which was interesting, even while he's saying, I no longer think of myself. I mean, he's such a dangerous mixture of conceit and arrogance. He is somebody who can be manipulated precisely because you said that this, there is something very egotistical yeah. about him. And he, he does believe that he can change, not Pakistan, but the world. No, he's a very bad mm. man. Everyone feels that I'm being used by these very powerful uh, right-wing groups. Now, you know, in the beginning I was confused, but then I realized why this is so current in Pakistan. Because, you see, when you see all our politicians, they actually never came on their own steam. They always were put there by someone else. They did not initially start off some achievement or grassroots support. Whole nation of Pakistan, they have a likening for Imran Khan. And uh, uh, we help Imran Khan in his fundraising campaign and now he's planning for education campaign. And we think that uh, this educational campaign is the requirement of this country. And Paspan will again uh, will be with him on his uh, uh, campaign for education and uh, uh, not pass ban only whole nation will support him in his educational program because they think that uh, whatever he says he is committed to his statement and he will uh, he will fulfill his uh, uh, promises to the common man to the nation a typical village school is just the place to begin here too, the day begins with verses from the Quran in Arabic and taught by rote. I will always be associated with the hospital, but what I want to do is to move into the field of education now. 
And I think that the biggest crisis coming in, in Pakistan in a few years will be our education system, which has collapsed. But worse, the falling literacy rate in Pakistan. So I'm, I'm just about to evolve a system, a plan, a mass plan in Pakistan, where on a self-help basis, we can start a literacy campaign. Every village, every town will have someone qualified to be a primary school teacher. The idea is that they themselves will provide the person. We will provide the organization. If they need extra money, we will raise the money for them. But the town or the village must get involved in a self-help basis, which gives them pride and self-esteem, which ensures that they will want to make it a success. The Pakistanis got together and built a hospital and I feel that that's how we must attack the education problem too. English should be taught everywhere. English and Urdu should be taught to all students in Pakistan, whether they come from uh, the upper, st upper strata of the society or from the masses. Why should the masses be deprived of the English language? as a means of education, as a means of acquiring higher education. Because at the moment, the masses are deprived of uh, the English language and cannot therefore compete in higher education. And I feel that English should be taught as a language, as a way of learning, as a way of uh, learning knowledge. But not people should not try and become English. Founders Day at Aitchison College, Lahore. An elite institution, it was formerly known as Chiefs College. The message was clear. The sons of the feudal lords were provided with an education, tea and cucumber sandwiches on the lawn. Whereas the ordinary Indians? Ladies and gentlemen, it appears I'm the only one... Nobody really cared. Please clap. That other end of the enclosure. Gentlemen, don't go to sleep. Please clap. Thank you. In the respective enclosures. Well done. To this day, the country's ruling class is educated here. The current president, Farooq Lakari, and the foreign minister, as well as Imran himself, are old Hsonians. In Hson, I was very privileged to have good education. But that education made me into an English public schoolboy rather than a Pakistani. I wasn't given a sense of my own history. The history I read about even India was history written by the English about India, their viewpoint, not by Indians themselves. Why is a small elite being given one education which enables them to get all the best jobs in the country? And why are the rest of the people deprived of that education? Whatever the syllabus is, it should be one syllabus. So everyone should be taught English and Urdu. And at the same time, they should be given proper scientific education because, you know, we have you no know, education in science and technology. And also then we should be taught about Islam. You see, what is happening is that the elite is not taught Islam. The masses are taught Islam, but perhaps not the progressive Islam. And the elite is not taught Islam at all. Imran is now the subject of even more speculation in the tea houses of Lahore. Imran Khan is a very popular person. He 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 is
ਆਪਣਾ ਸਾਡੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਕਲਚਰਲ ਟ੍ਰੈਡੀਸ਼ਨ ਹੈ ਮਦਨ ਪੈਦਾ ਤੇ ਉਸ ਕਲਚਰ ਕਲਚਰਲ ਟ੍ਰੈਡੀਸ਼ਨ ਹੀ ਜੋ ਹੈ ਲੇਕਿਨ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾਤਰ ਯੂਰਪ ਵਿੱਚ ਰਹੇ ਵਸੀਮ ਅਕਰਮ ਸ਼ਾਇਦ ਸਾਡਾ ਉਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਹੀਰੋ ਨਾ ਬਣ ਸਕੇ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਉਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੀ ਅੰਗਰੇਜ਼ੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਬੋਲ ਸਕਦਾ ਉਹ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਅਰਸਾ ਯੂਰਪ ਵੀ ਰਿਹਾ ਖਾਨ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਨਾ ਮਤਲਬ ਕਿ ਯੂਰਪ ਰਹੇ ਨੇ ਉਹਦੀ ਵਜ੍ਹਾ ਹੀ ਹੈ ਨਾ ਕਿ ਉੱਥੇ ਮਤਲਬ ਇਹ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਰੰਗ ਸ਼ਕਲ ਸੂਰਤ ਵੀ ਕੋਈ ਅੰਗਰੇਜ਼ਾਂ ਵਾਲੀ ਹੋ ਗਈ ਹੈ ਰਹਿ ਰਹਿ ਕੇ ਕੋਈ ਜੈਨੈਟਿਕ ਚੇਂਜਸ ਸ਼ਾਇਦ ਆ ਗਈਆਂ ਨੇ ਸਹੀ ਸਹੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਲੇਕਿਨ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਇੱਕ ਬਹੁਤ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਫੋਲੋਇੰਗ ਮਿਲੀ ਹੈ ਮੈਸੇਜ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਹਦੀ ਸ਼ਾਇਦ ਵਜ੍ਹਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਲੋਕ ਪੋਲਿਟੀਸ਼ੀਅਨਸ ਤੋਂ ਮਾਇੂਸ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਮਾਇ ਆਈਡੀਆ ਵਾਸ ਨਾਟ ਰੀਲੀ ਟੂ ਐਵਰ ਗੋਇੰਗ ਟੂ ਐਕਟਿਵ ਪੋਲਿਟਿਕਸ ਸੋ ਯੂ ਨੀਡ ਟੂ ਗੋ ਇਨਟੂ ਪਾਰਲੀਮੈਂਟ ਬਿਕਾਜ਼ ਆਈ ਕੀਪ ਥਿੰਕਿੰਗ ਯੂ ਨੋ ਇਟ ਵੁਡ ਜਸਟ ਕਟੇਲ ਮਾਈ ਪੋਟੈਂਸ਼ੀਅਲ ਇਨ ਥਿਸ ਕੰਟਰੀ ਆਈ ਫੀਲ ਰਿਮੇਨਿੰਗ ਆਊਟਸਾਈਡ I'm a bigger force you know by uh, standing for elections and uh, in this system which is completely corrupt spending huge amounts of money uh, and in a system where you cannot do much anywhere why would I want to go into politics what would it give me back in Islamabad the prime minister seems unconcerned well it would be rather nice because he'd divide the rightest vote but I believe he's not planning to do so well i actually don't understand about right or left wing politics in pakistan i mean does benazir seriously believe that she belongs to the left when she promotes capitalism she is completely uh, you know uh, does whatever americans ask her to do what how can she call herself left and the the difference her policies are no different to the previous government they are exactly the same So what is this right left politics it's just an eye wash and, and for me why would she put me in the right wing because i only believe in one politics and that's of right and wrong he has been a cricketing hero he emerged after his retirement from cricket as a man dedicated to social causes uh, most prominent of which was the cancer hospital that he has set up which is no mean achievement uh, his um, uh, desire to intervene in uh, uh, promoting and helping the education process literacy process in this country project that he is now embarking on according to reports um, he is a man considered clean uh in a in a milieu where politics has become almost synonymous with the uh, corruption and self aggrandizement and so therefore when he went out uh, on his fundraising campaigns uh he uh did uh, uh evoke a response from people and in a sense that response was also a reflection of the frustration of people with the existing political process they began to see in him some sort of a hero or messiah So far his public has remained loyal but will Imran's marriage now clash with the expectations of his supporters This marriage is not going to affect anything I'm hoping that my wife will help me I hope that Jemima will help me in my work and I know that uh, you know uh, that's what she wants to do so there is no clash I mean you'd be amazed that uh, and I was very pleasantly surprised that for someone of her age to insist uh, tell her mother that anyone who wants to give her presents she doesn't want any presents she wants donations to the hospital Imran may genuinely wish to stay aloof from parliamentary politics just as he once genuinely wished to marry a Pakistani woman However if the country was once again engulfed in a political crisis the army and civil service may well prefer to stay in the background but they would need a figurehead someone with a clean reputation <laughs>